to yet another Rhino video. Um, today we are going to uh, start off with uh, what I say from uh, our last session, which was uh, we made this table. Um, in a previous session, we also have this vase, which we'll kind of flip over and do something with at some point. Um, we have this desk lamp that we made uh, last session. And then uh, also just uh, for fun, uh, I went ahead and have this uh, sort of um, rotated mess of tables uh, saved in the file in case we need it. Um, and I'm sure we can figure out something to do with it. Um, I also have all of my build, build curves saved just in case I want to, you know, uh, replicate one of these objects or kind of start over, start over from scratch. Um, but what we're going to do in this session is we are going to make one more object uh, for this scene and we're going to use some of the uh, principles that we have already used and then we're going to also use some new techniques um, and then we are going to talk today um, well or just during this session primarily primarily about uh, starting to actually make an overall scene um, or an overall environment and uh, a couple different ways of doing that and then we're also going to think about uh, lighting. We're going to start to think about lighting um, and we may uh, we may be working with lighting into the next session. So first we're going to make an object. Um, so I want us to make a, a table lamp um, to kind of go with this whole scene um, or this collection of objects really right now. I think we can't fully call it a scene. Um, so I'm coming out here to the front view and just kind of like finding, um, you know, we can work on the origin. It doesn't really matter. There's, you know, obviously some sort of scaling and moving around of the stuff that needs to be done. Um, so I'm going to keep the table, um, the table on right now because I think the table is probably what I'm going to be scaling uh, everything to, to kind of like fit the table. Um, you kind of have to pick one thing and then make everything else look okay with it. Uh, so so I'm just going to keep the table on the screen, but I don't want to mess with it or I don't want to like select it or um, kind of deform it accidentally in any way by clicking on, you know, objects. Uh, it looks like it's a group right now, which is helpful. Um, but I'm also, uh, be just because I don't want to accidentally select it, I'm going to lock the layer temporarily. Um, and you can do that to just about any layer. So I'm going to make a table lamp and um, I think I'm going to go ahead and just make it level to where the table is. Not really for any particular reason, um, just more because uh, that way they'll, they'll both be at the same scale and I won't have to scale at least this one thing. So um, I'm going to right now I'm just making a control point curve. And I'm going to make like one of those floor lamps that you get at Ikea, you know, that is sort of like a tube that has holes cut in it. So um, I'm going to make like kind of a really abstract um, shape, a kind of simple shape. Let's see. Now I can tell already I made a mistake with the placement of this node, but I'm just going to kind of roll with it. Um, and I think that that's fine um, the way it is. Now, like I said, I made a mistake here with the placement of the po curve points. So if I select the object, um, and if the curve points don't automatically turn on, they should. Um, but if they don't automatically turn on, you can say show, uh, show curve edit points or show object control points. Um, and then from there, you can select the actual point itself and you can move it. And so what I wanted was, I just wanted this to be a little bit curvier. Um, and so you can see now I have that going. Um, in this case, I don't think I want to like rotate it like straight. I'm going to make a revolving surface first. Um, and I don't really think that I want to rotate it like on this with this as an, as its axis. Like we've done that a couple times. I don't want to use the origin either. Um, I'm going to set up just a little tiny line here to kind of reference where I want it to rotate from. So that way I can snap to it when I go to use the revolve command. 
So this is really all you need, just like a little notation. Also, you know, we want to make sure that that new line is uh, kind of pl planar or lines up uh, in the, this plane. So we can just move this uh, here. I'm going to zoom in just a tiny bit because I'm not. Okay, so now it's now it's perfect. And um, we could go ahead and start our revolve. And, you know, this is not going to be a super exciting shape. Um, I think I'm also going to go ahead and get rid of the table because we, I think its usefulness has passed at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and do, uh, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do a surface revolve. And this is the curve that I'm revolving. Okay, we've done this before, so this should be, you know, familiar. And then the start of the axis and the end of the axis just has to be two of those points. We want to take it on a full circle. Now, I want to do a couple more things to this form, because like I said, uh, we wanted to kind of poke holes in it. And that's where we're going to start doing maybe some things that are a little bit more new and a little bit more exciting. So. Um, if we kind of look at it right now, you can see that it's just one, a singular surface. It's not a solid. So I would very much be interested in making this a solid because in order to poke holes in it, we're going to have to use those uh, solid tools. So um, I'm going to grab the object, uh, go to the solid menu, and uh, make it a solid by capping the planar holes, which would be those two two holes on the top and bottom. Um, and you can see here that it's successful. Let me lower my screen a little bit. It says created two caps resulting in one closed object. Um, that's a really good thing. I did spend a, a little bit of time with uh, a couple of people in my office hours this past week troubleshooting uh, solid issues. If your form is not a solid, there is absolutely no hope that any of the solid functions or solid tools will work. Um, and usually if the form is not a solid, it's because there's a small gap. Um, so that gap could be like maybe here you, you selected 359 degrees instead of 360 degrees. Or maybe you accidentally moved one of these points before you capped it. Um, those are all like the types of, if there's basically means that there's some type of small gap. So my, uh, advice for fixing something that's not a solid is, unless it's not super obvious <laughs> why it's not a solid, probably make it over again and just try to be really careful um, when you do it. It can be super frustrating. Um, and so then, of course, there's always the give up option. But um, usually uh, recreating it um, from curves is, uh, you know, going to do the trick. Okay, so we have this object and we want to poke like tons and tons of holes in it. Um, I say tons and tons because, well, I mean, I think that's kind of the effect that we're looking for. Um, I have to sort of think about a couple of things. I have to think about what do I want the holes to look like? Like, do I want them to be round? Do I want them to be square? Do I want them to be triangular or maybe diamond holes, uh, diamond shaped holes? Um, that actually sounds kind of cool. Um, so maybe let's do um, the star function. And right now you can see I have it set to uh, three points. Um, I'm going to try setting it to four points. And then you can see that makes it into a sort of square. We could also use the square function. <laughs> Um, it's no big, no big deal. Um, and I kind of want it to be tiny. So I'm going to start over here and I'm going to actually make it, uh, pretty close to, pretty close to the middle of this, uh, sort of like axis, the one that we created the whole thing around, just so that way it's in the right place when, when we go to, um, use it. And so, yeah, we can go ahead and just make, uh, make us a rectangle, um, and deform it, which would probably be the most, uh, direct way to do it. So I'm going to make a rectangle. Um, I'm going to make it a square shaped rectangle. So 
what do you call a rectangle that's equal on all four sides? A square. <laughs> um, I'm going to make it up here just because it's kind of being stubborn with the snapping. Um, okay, so we had talked about using some kind of diamond shape, right? So, I mean, we can get there. That's easy enough. So first of all, we need to take this and we need to rotate it about 45 degrees. So let's go ahead and uh, use the rotate function. And I want to use this as my first reference point because I want that point to line up with the straight line. So that move it over there and then move it to the straight line. Okay. Um, I could probably go ahead and just throw this away if I wanted to. Um, this, um, excuse me, this object. And then uh, the sort of deformation that I want to apply now is super easy. I just want to take these two control points and bump them in uh, a couple of uh, clicks. So now they're in a place where you can see that they're looking pretty happy. So I want to verify um, that this is a planar curve. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, I'm going to extrude it, and then that is going to become my cutting object. Now, if I want to make this like even more complicated, which it's not really that complicated, but I think before I cut the holes out, it would probably be a good idea for me to go ahead and do that shell command so that what I'm cutting is not a hole through a solid object, but I'm cutting a hole through a solid that has walls around it. Um, and the reason that we want it to be hollow inside is because we're going to put light in and inside of it. We're going to put light bulbs inside of it. So it's going to be uh, casting a sort of uh, shaped uh, kind of glitter disco light all over the scene. So let's put a pause on this for just one second. We'll come back to it. And uh, for now, quickly, I'm going to go ahead and just use the shell command. And so, again, we've used the shell command uh, before in the video sequence, um, so it shouldn't be like a total surprise. Um, which face do we want to remove? Oh, probably the top, I think seems reasonable. Um, the thickness right now is set to 0.15. I think we could actually go a little bit thicker because, as you can see, it's pretty large. Um, so one of these tiny squares is uh, 0.25, so I would even go up to 0.25. Um, you know, we do want it to be sort of like paper or sheet metal or, you know, bark or some, some kind of like really thin material that's been worked with all these holes. Um, so we don't want it too thick. So I'm going to go with 0.25 and then work on this top surface is the one that we want to remove. Um, and you can see that that worked out beautifully. Um, so now, instead of kind of poking a hole through um, the, this solid mass where we would end up having it look like, you know, um, a shape that's pen penetrated the whole thing, it's going to make holes that um, are kind of on this shell. So our shape is still back here and we still have to do stuff with it. Um, what we're looking for is we're looking for a cutting object. So right now it's not going to cut the mustard because it's kind of just a shape and it's just sitting here. We need to give it some kind of dimension and we actually need to make it into us its own solid. Um, and usually what I try to do when I'm using the solid tools is I try to make sure that the two objects intersect fully. So so the easiest and sort of quickest way to get this into a form where it can be a cutting object is that we can take it and we can quickly, I'm just going to move it here. Um, this is not totally necessary, but, um, and of course it's kind of giving me a hard time. There we go. So I'm, I'm going to move it here and I'm going to go to the solid menu. Let me move this back up. I'm going to extrude planar curve straight. 
And I'm going to make one one little change to the parameters of this um, that that we didn't use before, and that is that I'm going to set it to uh, extrude on both sides. So that way, it's going to um, kind of emerge um, from from the center. Okay, so so now we have this kind of diamond shaped cutting object. Well, what else needs to happen? Well, um, I mean, I'm seeing a hole here, but I'm not really seeing, I'm seeing like the fact that we could poke a hole with this, but I'm not really seeing like lots of holes. Um, to make lots of holes, we're definitely going to need to, um, to sort of replicate this. And the best way to replicate form in Rhino is to use the uh, array function in the transform menu. So before we do that, I'm going to say, well, okay, what do we want to, how do we want to repeat it? Do we want to repeat it vertically? Do we want to repeat it along a line? So I have this idea that maybe we can repeat it on a spiral and have it kind of have these holes kind of like spiral up this form. Um, and that that would be kind of fun and look pretty cool. So let's uh, try that. You can make a spiral and technically in Rhino language, I'm not I'm not thinking of a spiral. I'm thinking of a helix. Um, a spiral is flat uh, in Rhino, and a helix is uh, something that is, you know, dimensional, like a DNA strand. So again, start of the axis should be here and there. Ah, perfect. Okay, so uh, we want a radius and a start point. Well, okay, so the radius you can see we can just kind of set here. Um, I think actually in this case the radius can be kind of tight. Um, in other words, it can be small because we're just wanting to use it as a reference point to spin uh, this this sort of you know blocky thing up. So I'm going to keep it uh, a little bit tight. You can see we can add turns. Um, so if you turn the turns up to like 20, um, there's that. And that makes it, uh, you know, quite a bit, um, quite a bit more sort of spinny. Um, you can also change the pitch, um, which changes literally the angle at which it's, um, turning. So, I mean, I don't sort of uh, feel like we have time right now to like kind of address all that stuff, but um, it's it's stuff that you can you can do. All right, are you ready? So now <laughs> we're going to um, take this object that we made and we're going to make this object ar array or repeat itself along this spiral. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of uh, I'm going to do a couple of things before I start to sort of try to fit this form to the to the spiral. Um, I'm going to take this shell object and I'm going to make a new layer and I'm going to get it out of the way uh, temporarily. So I can maybe call this uh, lamp shell. And let's see, I will throw it on there. And uh, now we can kind of see much more clearly how this form um, is in relationship to the sort of uh, spiral shape. And so uh, first of all, I want to bring it down uh, a bit. And uh, I'd kind of like to bring it to the point where it actually, where the, where the spiral actually starts. Um, and we'll just try that to see what happens. Of course, I would actually also kind of want it to be somewhat centered in that dimension. Okay, so now I'm going to go to Transform Array, array a long curve. These other array methods are really awesome. Um, you should totally try them out. Uh, they're great ways of making uh, kind of regularized copies of uh, small components. So a long curve. And then we select the path curve. And 
as promised, um, keeping this form close to where the curve starts is going to keep it nice and tight. So let's bring that uh, lamp shell back here and we can start to kind of see some of those. Um, well, let me get rid of it for just one second. And uh, what I'm going to do real quickly is just um, get out of that. Oh no, wait. <laughs> classic, classic rhino uh, mistake. I hate it when that happens. Oh well. Um, okay, so here's my path curve. Um, uh, by the way, um, you may want to, you know, play around with the number of items. You may also want to play around with the pitch. Um, and you certainly, if you want it to follow the curve exactly, you want to be in this uh, road-like mode. Um, you do not want to be in uh, freeform mode, although freeform mode can be pretty cool too. Um, it just doesn't, isn't going to look like kind of what you're following. So let's click done. And now here we are. So uh, what I'm looking to do is I'm just looking to kind of get all of these little extrusions and form a group so that they'll be a little more manageable. So I want to group these objects. Alrighty. And now I can bring back the lamp shell. Um, you can see that we've got a pretty solid, um, a pretty solid intersection here. Um, it looks like there's one object on the top that's not gonna, not, not really gonna make it. Um, and one object on the bottom. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just really, quickly going to uh, use the remove from group function and I'm going to uh, delete these guys. Uh, you can also just ungroup it if you want. Um, we've probably got a couple others that are not going to intersect. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Maybe they're just intersecting a tiny bit. Um, usually those are the kinds of things that I would get rid of. Um, I also, just because we want lots and lots of holes, um, I'm totally going to take this and just copy and paste it. And then I'm going to uh, rotate. Um, so, and just use the center for uh, a two-dimensional rotation in the top view. And I'm going to just take it and of course, I'm in ortho mode, which is not real great for rotating. So take it out of ortho mode. Um, and I'm going to take it kind of like a 45 degree angle so that it's just like another row of these things. Um, and now you can see I've got even more kind of wackiness. Um, I could probably make even, you know, another set if I wanted. Okay, but this is what we have. And I don't want to spend a super lot of time on this. So I think um, one of the things that we want to do now is we want to go ahead and take all of these holes and poke them out all at once. So um, this is not 100% guaranteed to work. Okay, so now we're going to take uh, these objects and we're going to apply a Boolean uh, function to them. So you can see that we have a lot more than two objects. Uh, we probably have about 70, 65, 70. So I'm going to select all of these objects. And I'm going to go to uh, Boolean uh, Difference. Oops, I always screw that up. Okay, so we're going to take the shell first. And then we're going to go to Boolean Difference. And then we are going to select the cutting objects, which are all of these crazy things. Okay. And we're just going to let it, let it do its thing. 
Um, and you can see, uh, without even, you know, deleting those objects, you can see that it's, it's gone ahead and it's made crazy holes. So, uh, we'll probably go ahead and just maybe move the objects off for now. Um, and you can see now this has tons of, tons of wacky holes. So, um, it's just something to think about, something, you know, to kind of maybe like uh, inspire uh, you and the way you think about light. I'm going to keep these cutting objects um, because they look pretty fun, um, to be honest. And I think I might be able to actually do something with them in the final uh, rendering. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just make, <laughs> make a layer and call it uh, cutting objects. And we are going to then put this in the layer. Alrighty. And of course, I'm going to turn it off. Maybe I missed the part where I put it in the layer. Yep, I did. Okay, so um, probably this uh, this helix could go on into the sort of um, construction curves. Uh, looks like I've got two of them. Um, the build curves layer. Hello. Oh, that's frustrating. I'm having kind of a frustrating day today. My fingers aren't working. All right. Uh, and so now that's gone too. Um, I could, you know, certainly, um, we're not going to worry about all that other stuff. So sometimes, you know, you can see um, when we were looking at the original, um, it uh, got kind of out of, um, you know, it gets weird in places, right? Where it kind of... Um, maybe got a little bit dense um so you know with a smaller cutting object you would probably be able to get something a little bit more like straight or sort of like faithfully spiral like um but anyway i mean sometimes uh you know having something that's a little bit uh kind of unplanned is a you know actually adds a quite a bit of interest um and something that's sort of you know mathematically prescribed so we want to talk about environments before we start lighting all this stuff. And um, I think in order to talk about environments, we need to get at least a basic idea of the scale um, that we're dealing with. So we'll move that. Um, right now, we're sort of kind of at this like, you know, office type scale. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw these in the build curve layer. Um, I'm going to show you two methods of creating an environment. Um, and they're fundamentally different. Um, I think that you'll uh, find that you're going to use probably one method or the other. Um, I think one is certainly a little bit easier than the other, but the uh, other uh, than one is also sort of like potentially uh, opens up some options. So. So first, um, we don't really even need these objects, but I'm going to keep them here just as a scale reference. Um, so the first environment that we're going to make is like the sort of straightforward um, how to make a room sort of uh, environment. And a room, as as you can guess, just from like looking around your room, it's a box. It's a box <laughs> with some with some added detail. So um, so you would literally use the box solid. Um, and so in this case, we can kind of make it, um, let me kind of get out of here because it's going to be quite a bit larger than the objects. Um, you can make this, let's say we'll make this your first corner. Actually, change my mind. Um, let's make the base in the top view. And so let's make our room fairly large. Um, you can see down in the bottom, uh, if I can show you, we're getting obviously a dimension kind of play out. Um, if you want uh, your dimensions to sort of be accurate, then you would just look at those numbers and they correspond to inches, of course. 
Um, it's not necessary that they be accurate. Um, and then for height, uh, you know, usually standard ceiling height in, uh, in American homes is about, uh, eight to 10 feet. Um, a sort of high ceiling would be somewhere between 15 to 25 feet. Um, so anywhere between eight and 30 feet. <laughs> um, and I would also maybe uh, kind of make the argument that what we're looking for and the end result with this room is a sort of picture of it. So if the, if the walls are too low, um, you're going to see a kind of horizon line, um, where your walls end. So, so making them higher is probably better. Um, so in this case, uh, it looks like we're at about like, you know, 15 to 18 feet. So this is like a luxury home now. Um, and then I'm just going to move the box down to be roughly level with the objects. So, um, so you can see, oh, here's my environment. Hmm. Something seems to be wrong with it. Uh, it seems to be a, a box that I can't see into. That's true. Um, yeah, cause it's a solid at this point. So, uh, so usually what I would do from here is just go to the box, select the box, explode it. Um, and now these are all, uh, individual surfaces that you can delete. Um, and you will want to delete at a minimum of two. Um, so that you can get a view like this. Um, possibly you may want to delete three if you're going for a sort of angled um, view like that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. And so this is a totally viable option to just make like a, a you know, a sort of traditional architectural space. Um, you can add windows, um, all of that stuff. If you want to, um, of course, you know, when I say add windows, um, because these are surfaces, you're not able to poke holes in them with, in the same way, um, that you could poke holes into a box. Um, but you could actually take these and give them a thickness and then by extruding them and then poke holes into them. Uh, so that's an option as well. Um, just to show you what I'm talking about. Um, well, now they're, now there are surfaces. Um, so if I were to um, extrude this into a solid, um, extrude planar curve straight, um, this one, excuse me, I'm always picking the wrong thing, extrude surface straight, um, and then this is it. And uh, I just want to kind of like, it, it only needs to have like a tiny bit of thickness. Um, but at this point now, I could take this wall and I could I could poke holes into it and um, do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, so you don't even have to do it to all of the sort of faces or surfaces. Um, it's just sort of something that you might want to think about. Um, turn on that desk lamp. So so this is pretty straightforward, you know. And to be honest, like you can make any shape into into an environment, you know. Um, I have seen some amazing spaces in Madison that um, are sort of like modern architecture that use um, sort of circular rooms or, um, you know, rooms that are not square. So um, I want to show you one method for working with a sort of like, like a room that's not square. Um, so before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and take these things because we're going to use these later, probably. And we're going to put these in the room layer. Okay. Get that in there as well. As I said, my fingers are not working today. Okay, so let's say hypothetically, you're like, okay, that room is all right, or whatever, I can see myself doing that. What if I wanted to make the outside of the environment really cool? Um, or not 
you know, a box. Um, okay, well, check it out. Let's use an ellipsoid. Um, so an ellipsoid is just a fancy word for a sphere that's stretched. Um, so let's go ahead and um, make it uh, from center. So I'll put the center like right underneath the table. And then it needs an axis. And then it needs uh, a sort of second axis and then a third axis. Okay. Um, again, we're sort of like in the same boat that we were before where we're sort of like a ship in a bottle, right? So what we're gonna have to do um, in order to sort of like get this opened up is we're going to have to maybe think about putting a box in here. Or if we want to be slick, a little slicker, we could do another ellipsoid. Uh, how is that going to work with a floor, though? Uh, I think we can figure it out. So <laughs> we'll do another ellipsoid um, inside of it. And I'm just going to kind of like not pay much attention to where I'm drawing this. So I'm going to make it slightly smaller. And then for that third axis, I'll come in and make it even a little bit tighter. So it'll be a little... Spaceships are not supposed to be roomy, you know. Um, and then, of course, I want everything to kind of fit in it. Okay. And I, there has to be some way for you to get in into it. So, so there we go. Okay, so we're getting there. Um, and basically what I would do is I would take this shape and subtract this shape from it. So let's do that Boolean two objects thing again. And we're going to select this and then select the little shape. And of course, it says click through results. Um, and we want something like that, um, which is going to be weird and interesting. Um, I think, I think that's just fine. I feel like, um, probably we would want a floor on this. Alrighty, so um, I'm going to make the uh, this sort of floor object, and I think to do it, um, I'm actually not going to kind of uh, get involved too much with what's going on in there. Um, I'm going to make it in this view, and I want it to be just uh, just bigger than the the sort of inner uh, sphere. And uh, this looks fine. Um, it looks uh, like I might want to scale it um, just a little bit. Um, I could probably edit these three points uh, in inward a little bit um, and make it sort of how I want. Um, now uh, I need to just get it at the right point uh, in the Y axis. So slide it down a little. And uh, it looks like now I can just do a uh, planar curves. So I could, whoops, here, in the solid venue. Yeah. Um, so there's my sort of floor um, inside that object. Um, when we go to actually render this stuff, um, this one, this uh, sort of environment is going to be a little bit more challenging um, because it's got, uh, you know, a different shape and uh, it's not sort of like, you know, your standard um, domestic environment, um, but we can certainly, you know, think about interesting ways to set uh, set that up. Um, if I go back to my actual room, uh, let me put this stuff on. I'll call this my space pod, uh, or just pod. And if we go back to um, the actual uh, room. I forgot to change the layer. Okay, let's do that. Ah, oh, brain work. Um, 
Okay, so now uh, in the room, I feel like we could probably start to uh, think about, you know, lighting. We can start to think about um, how to really like kind of bring these out as a scene. Um, and so we have a couple of uh, objects. We've got the vase. Um, so the vase goes on the table. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I'm going to zoom in a little bit in here. And uh, we're just going to spend about 10 minutes um, in this uh, video uh, sort of doing some basic lighting. And you'll see uh, that it sort of transforms uh, this, the scene uh, really quite a lot. Um, so zoom in, zoom in here. So it looks like I think that the small part is the bottom of the va vase. Um, so I want to use the rotate function and, uh, I guess it would be kind of nice if I rotated off of the midpoint. That seems reasonable. And I'm just going to do a straight 90 degree rotation here. So I don't want to snap to one of these points. Actually, um, I could turn my object snap off if I can do it. Sorry. Uh, my video player got me again. So all the player controls are all right this time I'm really going to do it because I moved the screen around okay so I've got these temporarily disabled and uh, now I should be able to do just a straight um, orthographic uh, 90 degrees no questions asked sort of um, sort of rotation and you can see I still had the copy uh, button on in rotation so now I've got two of them uh, maybe three of them. I only need one of them. Um, so I'm just going to kind of slide this down the table a little bit. And of course we have the desk, the desk lamp. Um, I think the thing to do with the desk lamp is probably to, uh, well, first of all, I want to group it together so that it's a little bit easier to kind of manage. Oh my goodness, all separate services? What was I thinking? <laughs> so I'm going to uh, just uh, quickly kind of um, get some of these other layers out of the mix. Um, and I'm going to lock the room. Um, so I'll go on the default layer so I can lock the room. Um, I'm going to lock the room for now because I'm not going to do anything to it um, in, in a while. Um, now that I have these all, all these little parts and pieces selected, um, I'm going to go ahead and group it uh, just for my own convenience. And I'm going to um, go ahead and bring the table back. And um, I really just need to kind of think about where these objects fit in relationship to the table. Um, oh, <laughs> I was like, where's the vase? Um, of course, it's there. So I want to kind of place these objects on the table. And uh, this vase can go maybe up here. Yeah, and then this. It looks like this needs to rotate. Um, I'd like to have it so that maybe, you know, the desk is facing the outside uh, or the empty area of the room, sort of the traditional or, uh, orientation. Um, so I probably want this lamp to kind of maybe fit like catty corner, uh, this way. So I'm going to rotate it first. Uh, I'm going to turn ortho off. If we see, let's get rid of ortho. And of course that'll allow me to kind of spin it freely. Okay. I'm going to just delete that one. Uh, this is a construction curve or a build curve that can go down here. Um, and uh, then I'm just going to kind of freehand move this uh, until it looks reasonable. So that looks reasonable, except that it seems absurdly close to the vase. And also, I feel like the vase looks absurdly large. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to move the vase over here. I'm also going to 
scale it down. So I'm going to do a two dimensional scale and um, just start a point. The reference point when you scale stuff, usually I, I choose just the leading edge of the form so you can kind of keep up with it. Whoops, sorry, it's three dimensional. That's a two dimensional scale. I actually want to do a three dimensional scale because um, we want to scale everything down. I was sort of not thinking about that. And so now we're doing kind of a proportional three-dimensional scale. There's also a one-dimensional scale, which is really cool for when you want to kind of like, um, uh, when you want to um, stretch things out or, you know, uh, only work uh, in one dimension as it implies. All right, so now we've got this stuff together. Let's add a couple of lights. So um, the first light that I'm going to add is not one of these lamps. Um, we'll kind of get, get to those. Um, the first light that I want to add is a spotlight. And so you can find all of the lights um, up here. And you can see there's a spotlight, a point light, a directional light, a rectangular light, a linear light. Um, and we're going to be, we're going to be looking at all of these. Um, so the spotlight is one of my favorites. Um, it asks for a base of the cone. Um, and you can see, okay, let's put it kind of in the back corner of the room. And then you get a radius. So let me zoom out here so we can see what's going on. So the radius of the spotlight is going to be here. Um, and then it asks you to uh, come up with the end of the cone, which is where you sort of set, set the angle. So I like a good sort of like classic photo lighting, which is a 45 degree, uh, 45 degree spotlight. So make it at a roughly a 45 degree angle. And uh, then from there, you can kind of move it into place. Um, I find it kind of annoyingly uh, hard to um, get the lights exactly where you want them uh, when you first make them. So, so let's go ahead and, oh my gosh, plug in my computer. Um, so let's go ahead and make this light um, right there and just see what happens. So the best way that you can preview lighting in Rhino is by uh, control clicking here, setting up a rendered viewport. And then you will see your light. Now we're also seeing something else, which is what happens when we don't have any lights, which is called glow. It's a global illumination. Rhino calls it skylight, which I think is sweet. Um, but in general, if you're doing your own lighting, you don't need the skylighting. The skylighting is actually just going to interfere. Um, so let me show you what the skylighting looks like without, um, so I'm going to turn this. I almost, of course, have a lights layer. Um, and the reason I do that is because it makes it really easy to turn the lights off and on. Um, so I can go ahead and get that on there, take the light off, and you can see that what, what Rhino gives us is a sort of like generic um, kind of uh, shading, really. I wouldn't call it light, I would call it shading. Um, so the way that we can kind of get rid of this is we can get, we can go to the render settings. And so if we go to the render properties, um, we want to set up a couple of things. So, so the resolution and quality we'll get into later because we're not going to make finished renderings right away. Um, I would start by turning off the skylight. Um, and then other things, let's see, blah, 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 doesn't matter. Um, we may come back to this later, um, but this for now I think is uh, useful. It's really enough for now. 
So you can see some of our um, some of our curves and other objects are sort of like uh, showing their edges. Um, that's something that it shouldn't do when it when it renders. Um, so we will be able to not see that. Um, but what you're seeing now is basically just the default sort of simulated light. Um, so this is not the skylight. The skylight gives it that kind of fuzzy, you know, all over effect. Um, and uh, Rhino's default actually does give you a generic sort of directional light source. But let's turn that, that spotlight back on. Whoa! <laughs> um, it's like a lot of stuff, okay? Um, so yeah, um, you know, using actual lighting um, is just going to give you an incredibly different effect. Um, the last thing that I think I want to do is probably uh, I'm going to put some point lights in this lamp um, and then we can kind of uh, break for our next session. So sorry it was a little random today. I was like, um, obviously under caffeinated. So um, probably, you know, again, like, you know, we want to get this thing perfectly in the center here. Um, so probably the best way to do that, um, to be honest, is to just um, place it um, and then uh, let's go ahead and make a couple of them. So I have these three lights now. You can see it's like, whoa, oh my God. It's like, you know, nuclear level of light. Um, <laughs> that's because uh, right now the intensity on them is all like up to, you know, 100%. So um, if you come into uh, this part over here, um, you can uh, kind of turn down the shadow intensity. You can turn down the intensity of the light too. And so the more lights you have, the less intense you want each light. Um, and in general, lighting works better when you have more than two lights. Um, I would say definitely more than one. Um, and so now I'm just going to drag these actually into the thing. Um, and I'm probably going to have to do it more than once because they're probably... Let me put myself over here. So at the end of all that, you can see that there was some method to the madness. <laughs> and um, uh, we have managed to uh, get some really interesting effects um, with a couple of objects and a couple of light bulbs. Um, so that's what Rhino uh, in, in the idea of rendering is really all about. It doesn't matter if the objects are going to hold their weight. It doesn't matter if the objects are, you know, um, built for 3D printing. Um, when we're thinking about making these scenes, um, we're really, you know, kind of like emphasizing the visual impact um, that you get through rendering. So um, I'm going to sign off and leave you until our next video. Thanks. Bye.